This case was so horrific. Coroner and the sheriff's office initially investigated this case in January, and the conditions that she was found were just unbelievable. One can only imagine Lacey's suffering. You don't treat anybody or any animals like that. Lacey Ellen Fletcher grew up in a small Louisiana town called Slaughter, located about 30 minutes north of the state's capital of Baton Rouge. Now when I say small, I mean really small. Slaughter boasts a population of less than 1,000 residents per the 2020 census. This is the type of place where everybody knows everybody and everyone else's business, or so you'd think. So when Lacey Fletcher went missing for 15 years, some neighbors had questions, but tragically never took it any further. Lacey was the daughter of Clay and Sheila Fletcher, who were described as pillars of their community. The family lived a fairly normal, church-going, middle-class life. When Lacey was nine years old, the Fletcher family moved into a quaint two-story home along a gravel cul-de-sac, where Lacey made friends with the other kids around her age that lived in the neighborhood. Lacey attended school at the former Brownsville Baptist Academy, where she was described as extremely smart and sweet. She was the type of girl that was very welcoming to newcomers. She was also a member of the school volleyball team and attended worship services at a Baptist church in the nearby town of Zachary. Lacey also had autism, and at the ages around 14 or 15, she had to be homeschooled due to increasing social anxiety. And as she grew, her neighbors started to notice that she wasn't the same happy or cheerful girl that she used to be, and she wasn't getting as mature as some of her peers. Lacey enjoyed activities geared towards a much younger audience and became enveloped in a world that involved kids' movies and toys, while her former friends had developed more typical teenage interests such as cars, celebrity news, or dating. Due to their vast disparity in interests, a lot of her former friends sadly moved on, and Lacey was left behind. The last time Lacey was seen in public was when she was about 21 years of age. Her neighbor, Robert Blades, who was a retired welder, spotted Lacey walking around the neighborhood carrying a small set of weights. She appeared to be physically normal in terms of appearance. She was a thin girl, but she had always been thin, so this wasn't concerning to Robert. In fact, her neighbor had seen her exercising in the roadway on a few occasions, so none of this was out of the ordinary at all. Now, given how small of a town Slaughter is... It is reasonable to think that Lacey would have been seen again in passing eventually. However, Robert Blades never saw Lacey again for a number of years, and so he questioned her father, Clay Fletcher, about her whereabouts. He asked how Lacey was doing, if she had gone off to college or gotten married or simply moved on from the small town like many before her had. Clay advised his neighbor that she was fine and still around, but he quickly changed the subject. With no reason to question her own father on his daughter's safety, Robert Blades took Clay Fletcher at his word. But still years had passed, and he never saw Lacey again. It wasn't until this year, 2022, did the mystery of Lacey Fletcher's whereabouts finally come to a close. On January 3rd, 2022, around 2 in the morning, her mother Sheila called 911 to report that her daughter wasn't breathing. However, sources indicate that there's a possibility that Sheila wasn't calling on her own volition. According to Robert Blades, the neighbor, another unnamed member of their neighborhood had spotted Lacey on the couch in Sheila's home and told her and Clay that they needed to call the police. The coroner, Dr. Ewell Bickham, was immediately called to the scene after a horrified sheriff's deputy reported back with their findings. What the first responders encountered in the otherwise innocuous home was the stuff of nightmares. Lacey Fletcher, now 36 years old, was dead. Her body was found partially clothed in an ill-fitting blue checkered top, sitting upright and completely covered from head to toe, in her own bodily wastes. She was sitting cross-legged, the way most folks do when they want to get comfortable. Her top lip was curled upward, which exposed her teeth. She was infested with insects and covered with insect bites. Her hair had become all knotted and matted. Lacey was essentially fused to the couch. In fact, she had been in that position for so long 
she had begun to melt through the couch. While paramedics declared that Lacey had died at the scene, Dr. Bickham determined that she had died 24 to 48 hours earlier due to her state of decomposition. However, due to the condition of her body, it was difficult to tell. Her backside was so black and deformed that you could barely discern what it was. The scene within the living room was so gruesome that even Dr. Bickham, a seasoned coroner, was severely affected by the state that he found Lacey in. It was so bad that he has been quoted as stating that he could not eat and that he had crying fits for a full week. Autopsy reports indicated that Lacey's cause of death stemmed from severe medical neglect. This led to chronic malnutrition, acute starvation, immobility, acute ulcer formation, osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection, and this finally resulted in sepsis. She was also reportedly suffering from bacterial infections and tested positive for COVID. She weighed 96 pounds at the time of her death, and evidence led investigators to believe that Lacey had been on the couch for at least 12 years. Lacey's death was officially ruled as homicide due to severe neglect. But how did Lacey end up like this? Well, according to reports, Lacey suffered from a locked-in syndrome, which is a rare neurological disorder in which there is complete system paralysis of all voluntary muscles except for the ones that control the movement of the eyes. Individuals with locked-in syndrome are conscious and awake, but they have no ability to produce movements or to speak. Lacey had essentially become a prisoner inside of her own body and was at the complete mercy of her parents, who had appeared to have chosen to neglect her. In fact, Lacey hadn't seen a doctor in 20 years. When interviewed by police, the Fletchers advised them that they didn't bring their daughter to see a doctor because she did not want to go. In a strange juxtaposition to the state in which Lacey was found, the Fletcher home was surprisingly neat aside from the odor. Even the living room that she was found in was a bizarre scene and was not what you'd expect to find outside of what's already been detailed here. Next to the couch was a gray commode and a neatly folded pile of laundry. In front of the couch was a black coffee table which sat bottles of lotion, talcum powder, packs of wipes, nasal spray, and other personal care items. Between the sofa and the coffee table were boxes of DVDs for Lacey to watch. So with all of this in mind, how on earth did Lacey end up in the state in which she was found? The horror of Lacey's death shook the community of slaughter, as her parents didn't seem like the type of folks that had it in them to put their daughter through such a hellish existence. Sheila was a police and court clerk in the nearby city of Baker and more recently an assistant to the city prosecutor in Zachary. She was also on Slaughter's Board of Aldermen, which you would know is like a city council, and she directly served the mayor. Clay Fletcher was an officer of a nonprofit called the Baton Rouge Civil War Roundtable. However, one of the biggest shockers to the Fletcher's friends and colleagues is that they actually didn't even know that she had a daughter. On May 2nd, 2022, hundreds of graphic images of the scene of Lacey's death were shown to a grand jury in nearby Clinton, Louisiana, which was during a closed door hearing that the press was not allowed to attend. The violent photographs convinced the 12 member committee to charge Sheila and Clay Fletcher with second degree homicide, which carried a possible sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Shortly after, the two were arrested and released after 36 hours on $300,000 bond each. The two had not been brought to jail prior as they were not deemed a flight risk. Their trial is expected to start in October. As this story is still developing, we'll be sure to keep an eye out for updates as they come out. Sorry about Bean. Well, maybe not so sorry about Bean. I know a lot of you have been asking about how she's been doing here. Let me show you Bean. We talk a lot about harm and neglect inflicted upon minors on this channel. But another form that's not discussed nearly enough is that in which is inflicted upon those with disabilities. According to the World Health Organization, persons with disabilities make up around 15% of the world's population, and there's 7.9 billion people in this world as of May 2022. Think a little bit about how many 15% is. 
And also, minors with disabilities are three times more likely to be in danger than their peers. There is an approximate 50% increased risk of experiencing harm for adults with mental health conditions. Daughter Bean, stop it. Can you hold her, please? Persons with disabilities are attractive to predators as they may not have the resources and abilities to escape the situation or communicate the occurrences to those that could help them. Those who are hard of hearing or deaf are placed at twice the risk for neglect and emotional harm in comparison to other disabilities, and nearly four times in regards to physical harm. This type of harm can also manifest itself financially, with predators stealing benefits from the disabled party. We see this most commonly with elderly people, but it does happen to the disabled as well. In Lacey's case, she had been essentially cut off from her peers in her mid-teens and homeschooled. And as her disabilities became more dire, her parents didn't seek out proper medical care for their daughter despite having the resources and positions within the community to obtain the care she so desperately needed. Suffering from locked-in syndrome, Lacey could not advocate for herself, care for herself, nor could she escape the prison that she ultimately succumbed in. We talk a lot about minors and how CPS fails them on this channel, and we will never stop doing so. But have you ever stopped to think about how many adults and elders with disabilities might be out there suffering in conditions similar to Lacey and being taken advantage of in ways that nobody would even know about? What do you, the listener, think would be an appropriate sentence for Sheila and Clay Fletcher? Do you agree with the charge of second-degree homicide, or should it be something stronger? Do you think that they knowingly caused their daughter to die because they no longer wanted to deal with her? Or do you think they made a series of horrific mistakes? What kind of sentence would you give them if you were the judge? At the end of the day, what we do know is that Lacey did not deserve any of this. She deserved to be loved, to be cared for, to be kept clean and healthy and comfortable. As it stands right now, it looks like her parents failed miserably. I wanted to apologize last week for the amount of flubs and misspeaks that we did. It was a very trying week, almost losing Prada. A lot of you know this, they saw our community post on the channel. Prada, just really quickly, Prada went through a medical emergency. She's back home with us now, as you may have heard earlier, but uh, it was very tough. You can read more about it in our GoFundMe, which is linked below. And I know times are tough right now. If there's anything you can spare or if you can share a GoFundMe around to help with Prada's care, we would greatly appreciate it. We just lost Kitan two months ago, and it would be devastating to lose Bean. We want her around for many more years to keep Bean mouthy while we record. And to those who have donated already, shared it, offered kind words, offered advice for diabetic cats, thank you so much. That's completely valuable information. We're really, really new to this. I didn't know what we were getting into. Obviously, I would do whatever it takes to, to keep her with us. But the thought of like giving your cat shots is pretty scary. And luckily, she's taking it very well. Yes, she's been very good. And she is currently her cuddly, aggressive self. So hopefully she stays this way and she'll be stable going forward. For those that want to help in other ways, you can do so completely for free by just subscribing to the channel, watching our videos to the end, and sharing us with somebody that you think would like us. That goes a long way in raising our platform. We also have a very wonderful group of people going that extra step to support us on Patreon. I will put their names up right now. I want to say welcome to three new patrons, Teresa, D, and Laura. Special shout out to our Levi tier patrons, Laura, Levi, Holly, Chaka, Amelia, and Casa de Cadejo. There's their lovely pictures right now. Shout out to Kiki and Melissa, our highest tier Patreon supporters. There's their lovely pictures right now. Thank you all so much for the support you've given us. There's Halls and Dolls, Holly's Mask Store. If you want access to the best quality masks we've ever worn, Holly's Etsy link is down below. But until next week, we love you. We love you. Bye. Bye.